Sakpa acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. Sakpa commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our speakers today are George Cool, who will speak first, and Ross Kil Kilgore. Speaking on the topic, why should we bother trying to save old buildings, even if they are historic? Please join me in giving a hearty welcome to our guests. I am the chair of the Historic Places Advisory Committee for the City of Lethbridge, and we'll give you a little bit of a background as to what that committee is, what it does, and uh, some of the things that we're working on right now. Uh, just have to get familiar with the... Ah, thank you. Okay, so uh, this afternoon we're gonna be talking about what heritage is, uh, protecting historic places in Lethbridge, who has a role in that historic um, preservation. Uh, we'll talk about actual municipal historic uh, resource designations. We'll talk about the, um, the number of designations and, and those specific uh, buildings and properties in the city that have those designations. And we'll talk about what we're actually working on right now in terms of uh, a new heritage management plan. The current one was done in 2007. So what is heritage? Heritage is essentially things valued from the past. And you can look at it from a, a couple of points of view. Intangible heritage, things that are like stories and, and those kinds of things, oral histories, or the more tangible things, buildings, uh, artifacts, things like that. If we go down sort of the hierarchy uh, in, in the tree of, of heritage, you look at what might be a movable, such as artifacts that you'd find in a museum. We don't deal with that with the uh, Historic Places Advisory Committee. We deal with uh, properties, um, areas, and uh, basically geography buildings, those kinds of things. So why, why do we do this? Why is it important? And as, as Bev indicated in the title of the, of the um, presentation, why is it important that we do this? And I think um, it, a lot of it is value-based. We, we, and people who think like we do in, in terms of preserving historic places, is there's real value in um, recognizing uh, the historic roots of your community, and a lot of that is expressed in the, in the kind of buildings that we have. There's a general perception, I think, in society that uh, new is better than old, and replace instead of adaptive reuse uh, or adaptively reuse buildings and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge to that kind of paradigm in terms of what we're actually trying to do. So, uh, in preserving uh, historic resources, we're talking really about uh, a number of uh, a number of facets, and if you look again at um, economic, social, environmental, they're they're all sustainability uh, principles. And uh, by taking this approach in terms of um, preserving our historic resources, you know, we we delve into those three things in in particular. And I guess. What, what really brings it home is the value to uh, property owners. I mean, there's a societal value, but there's also a, a tangible value to people who own property, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So how do we do it? As I mentioned before, um, there was a heritage uh, management plan done in 2007. That basically set the, the baseline, the framework, and, and the framework for which you know, the number of years that we've been doing this since then uh, have adhered to. And so, um, as it's getting a little bit long in 2007, it was quite a while ago, um, we recognize that our, you know, through our experience that a number of things weren't actually addressed in the uh, old or the existing heritage management plan. And Ross will get into a little bit of detail about what's happening with the, the new heritage management plan that's being created. In order to um, sort of give muscle to uh, the heritage management plan, City Council also passed a, a policy 
um, to enable you know some of the recommendations that were in the uh, heritage management plan so that we could actually do the work. And so who, who has a role? Well, I've already mentioned City Council a number of times. There's a Historic Places Advisory Committee that is appointed by City Council. There's the administration, um, Ross and, and people in the Planning and Design Department and, and City Clerk's Department. There's the Provincial Government through Albert Historic Resources Foundation. There's a fantastic per person uh, called Fra named Fraser Shaw who is just an invaluable resource uh, both knowledge-wise and experience-wise, who really um, knows Lethbridge quite well, and he comes down here quite a bit. Whenever we have a question about a building, Fraser is, is there to help us out. And of course, property owners, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So what is the role of City Council? As I said, City Council establishes the Historic Place Advisory Committee and maintains the committee, and by that we mean, you know, some of the uh, sort of administrative types of requirements, not not uh, the stuff that uh, Ross does in, in planning and design, but more of the um, administrative stuff, minutes and and getting information together and that kind of thing. And again, um, looking at the, the historic places policy from time to time, that will need amendment as as we we grow and change with the demands of the community. And then uh, at the, you know, the larger level, the, the role of city council is spelled out in the um, Historic Resources Act. So the Historic Places Advisory Committee, uh, our role is essentially to advise city council on potential historic designations. And um, that, that's a, quite an involved uh, process at times. And again, Ross will get into the, the more detail of that. But essentially, uh, we evaluate applications that come forward and um, go through a fairly thorough evaluation. It, it's, it's not a short process because there's a lot of consultation that actually takes place. So you know, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, when we do make a recommendation to City Council that, you know, the, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Uh, the committee itself is comprised of uh, five members, Les Lesbridge Historical Society. Uh, I, I represent that society on the board. Uh, we have an architect, we have a, a traditional indigenous land use expert, and uh, an indigenous person, as well as uh, a member at large. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the main administration is, is uh, through the planning and design department of the uh, city, and uh, Ross is, is our resource in that area, and so he overlooks the actual implementation of the plan. He's sort of the portal to the, to the overall process. And he provides us with uh, the information, recommendations, and so on as we you know, nurture uh, an application as it goes through the, through the process. Um, from time to time, uh, there will be a, um, a property that um, requires some kind of a change, and so we evaluate that if, to make sure that it isn't in, in contravention of the bylaw that has designated the property. And so um, we'll look at an intervention process, and sometimes that can be done at an administrative level. Sometimes if the change is large enough, then it might have to go back to City Council. And again, the province of Alberta, um, <laughs> things have really changed in terms of the role of the province. Their, their legislated role, their administrative role is pretty much the same, but the financial resources have really dwindled when it comes to supporting you know, this kind of initi uh, initiative province-wide. Property owners, none of this really happens unless a property owner wants it to happen. If they have, if a person has a, a property that has historic value, and we'll, we'll evaluate that according to um, the resources that we have um, created in the past, the a register, or not a register, but a, um, an evaluation of several hundred properties. In fact, I, I think if you looked at the overall map that we have there's something like 4,500 properties that could possibly be eligible in the city of Lethbridge. And that's primarily date related, not necessarily related to the historical relevance of the, of the site. So a person needs to, needs to be interested, the property has to be eligible, and then we go from there.
um, an application is made, we don't uh, deal with any applications uh, that haven't been made by the actual property owner. Uh, it's essential so that we avoid any kind of um, uh, conflict between what we might see as a value, um, an aesthetic value or whatever, and uh, maybe a financial value or some kind of other conflict that uh, might compromise the process and the actual ability for a property to be designated. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I think I'll turn it over to Ross now to go through a little bit more of the detail and certainly identify uh, a number of the sites that I'm sure a lot of you will be very familiar with. Thanks. Thanks, George. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of run you through how we identify these sites and the process for designating them and so, and so on. So as George alludes to, we, we start off with casting a really wide net. So um, what we call a heritage survey, which we've undertaken a couple of in the history of this heritage program. It's, it's almost more like a, a windshield survey or a, a drive-by type of survey where you're, you're really just identifying properties that could potentially um, be worth looking at. Uh, and so that's been done in the past with a lot of volunteer effort, which has been really appreciated. <clears throat> people putting in hundreds of hours just to, to pound the pavements and, and make notes. Uh, and so, uh, as George mentioned, that's currently about 4,500 sites across the, the, the city. Um, the next step from there, um, where we kind of narrow things down a bit and start to get a bit more selective, is a places of interest list. So we do a little bit of research and, and, and note down the ones that uh, have a bit more potential for designation. And so that's kind of the, the circle you see here in the diagram getting smaller. Uh, and then when things start to get a bit more serious is the, the heritage inventory. So we've done uh, four inventories up till now and we're planning to probably do another one in the next uh, two or three years. Um, that's where we actually look at each individual site and do a bit of research and figure out if that site meets our criteria for potential for designation. And so the, the two main criteria are significance and integrity. So significance is about you know, what's the, does, does this place have some kind of historic uh, significance? And that could be for any number of different reasons. Um, the obvious ones being things like architecture, you know, the architectural style or era. Is it something that's quite unique in this area, even in the province? Um, does it use unusual materials uh, and so on? Uh, it could also be because it's associated with uh, an important person. So perhaps it was the house of the, the first mayor of Lethbridge, for example. Um, and so if it meets that significance criteria, then we look at the integrity. So is that place um, still, uh, does it have some of the original fabric from the, the, the period of significance? So if, again, if it's an architectural uh, significance from say the, the early days of Lethbridge's development, is that material still there or has the building been completely rebuilt over time and there's not really much of that original fabric left? So if it meets those two criteria for significance and integrity, uh, what we do is create a document called a Statement of Significance. And that's usually just two to five pages long. It sets out what the heritage value is of that historic place, and it creates a list of character-defining elements. And so those are really the key uh, aspects of its significance, um, which if it goes on to be designated, those, those character-defining elements have to be maintained. And so, uh, our current inventory is uh, 68 uh, historic places, um, but the important thing about this heritage inventory is that it doesn't actually confer uh, any protection at that stage. It's, it's more just about recognition, so it's recognizing the, the, the importance of that historic place, um, but people are still free, you know, the owner is still free to tear down the, the, the building if they, if they like. There's no actual protection. 
Uh, what we do there from there is we try to encourage the, the owner to apply for designation. Um, and if they do and, and the designation goes ahead, um, then it gets added to the, the heritage register, including the Alberta register. Uh, so currently we have 28 uh, municipal historic resources. So those are places that have been designated. And there are 17 provincial historic resources as well in the city. And there is a bit of overlap there between the two. So I'll just kind of run through the, the designation process. So this is all um, set out in the, the Historical Resources Act at the provincial level. Um, and that sort of gives power to City Council to pass bylaws to designate municipal historic resources. And it sets out the responsibilities and so on um, between the different parties. Uh, when designation occurs, it, it does go on to the title of the property, so it's something that passes on even with ownership changes or changes of use and so on, uh, that doesn't af affect the designation. <clears throat> So this is sort of the basic steps of, of designation. Um, uh, if, if the site is coming from our heritage inventory, so it's already on the inventory and has a statement of significance and so on, then it's a lot more um, ready to go. If it's someone who's just kind of called us up and said, hey, I have this, this interesting place that you should take a look at, I'm interested in designation, then we have a bit more work to do and it can take a bit longer through, through the Historic Places Advisory Committee to do that research um, and, and create those documents. But once we get past that stage and, and the Historic Places Advisory Committee has decided that yes, this place is worthy of designation, then they make that recommendation to, um, to City Council. And so I take that request for decision to City Council. Um, and then there's a notice of intent to designate is sent to the property owner and we give them a 60 day uh, cooling off period before we actually bring the bylaw to City Council um, for designation. And so once City Council has passed that bylaw, that uh, puts into force the designation and it's attached to the title of the property. Uh, we then create these uh, heritage plaques as well. Uh, you may see a number of these throughout the city, particularly in the downtown. It doesn't always mean that the place is designated. So the, the larger plaque that you see at the top, um, you may see those on places that aren't designated uh, just as kind of a, you know, an information for the, the public about an interesting place. The smaller plaque at the bottom there is the one that actually sets out that, that this place is a designated as a municipal historic resource. Uh, so the, these can be placed on buildings or, or, or on a plinth, uh, whatever is appropriate. And um, <clears throat> these are paid for through the committee that George is, is, is the chair of. Uh, and Lethbridge Historical Society sometimes contribute to that as well. Um, these are really nice plaques made of bronze, and, and the, they're getting quite expensive, unfortunately. So we may have to look at alternative materials in the future. So I'll give you kind of a, a run through just for fun of the, uh, the currently designated sites in the city. So. This is just an overview of the provincial ones. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a bit of overlap with the municipal ones as well. But there are currently 17 of these in, in the city. I think the most recent one was Nika Yuko Centennial Garden. Uh, and so the, the, the province is essentially looking for places that are uh, significant at, at a provincial level. So it's a little bit more uh, selective. Uh, at the municipal level, so we. Oh, well, perhaps we could read those because the people in the back. Oh, you bet. Certainly. So, um, so number one is the uh, Riverview, which is the C. A. McGrath House. Uh, number two is Dr. Arthur Haig Residence. Number three is the W. D. L. Hardy Residence. Number four is Chinese Freemasons Building. Number five, Lethbridge Fire Hall. Number one. Number six is the Coney Bear Residence. Number seven, Sir Alexander Galt Museum. Number eight, Bowman Art Centre. Number nine, Lethbridge C. P. R. Station. 10 is the Blackfoot Cree Indian Battle Site. 11 is the Isolation Hospital. 12 is the E.B. Hill Residence, which you can see in the, the bottom right image there. Number 13 is Nikuyuko. Number 14 is the Boon Tong Co Building in Chinatown. And number 15, right next door to that, is the Mani Opera Society Building. 16 is the Lethbridge Federal Building, also known as the, the Post Office. And number 17 is the Annandale Residence. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So uh, I'll run through 
in uh, chronological order, the, the municipal designation. So <coughs> starting off in 2008, just after our heritage program was set up in its, in its current form, um, we have the, the Spudnut Shop or the Lethbridge Conservatory of Music on the left there. And then, then on the right is the Annandale residence. You can see it in its present day form. And then on the right, there's a smaller image from when it was pretty new, sometime after 1909, that photo. Uh, 2009 we added the the Vendome Hotel which is the the bottom left image that's uh, also known as the Alberta Rooms so that's on uh, I believe 8th Street South just around the corner from Chapters and then we have the Acadia block in the top left so that's on 3rd Ave South just across from Galt Gardens uh, and then at the top image you have the DJ Whitney house which is in the southeast of the city that was originally a, a farmhouse but obviously the city's, the city's grown out around it and then on the right, the Hicksale building, also known as Catwalk. And then in 2011, we added the Bells Welding building, also known as Mocha Cabana, which I, I know recently shut down. Um, really interesting building made of uh, concrete. There's a couple of historical photos out there too. And then in 2012, we added the Cross Grey residence, which is on 12th Street South, just south of 6th Ave. Uh, and then the bottom image, there's the Red Cross or LDS Church building, which is just down the road actually from the Cross Creek residence on 7th Ave and, and uh, 12th Street. And then in, in the right image, we have the Baird Grocery on the north side. In 2013, we added the Norse residence, which is just up the road um, on 4th Ave. So uh, a couple of new images and one historical one there. You can see in the <coughs> in the historical image, the entrance uh, was changed over time. So originally it had the, the colonnade with the, the balcony above, and that's been changed at some point a few decades ago, at least, uh, to what we see today. In 2014, we added th this pair, uh, neighboring pair in uh, Chinatown, so the Boan Tong and the Mani Opera Society. Uh, and there's a historic image there in the bottom right. So uh, these two have, have been through a lot of ups and downs in the last um, decade or two. So the, it's under new ownership now. So we're, we're you know, hopeful that the new owners are going to be able to invest in the buildings and, and uh, make sure that they're structurally sound and bring them back into active use. In 2015, we added the Shackleford residence on the left there uh, in Victoria Park, and then the Nikayuko Centennial Garden at the bottom, and the post office building, also known as the, the Federal Building or J.D. Higginbotham Building. That, that's actually was designated at the provincial level as well, and it used to be federally designated too until the, the federal government sold it a couple of years ago. Just by practice, they, they remove designations when they sell the buildings. I'm not sure why, <coughs> but it's still protected through the municipal and provincial designations. And then in 2016, we designated the Southminster United Church just up the road and the Buchanan residence in the bottom left image, which is in Victoria Park, just across from the, the Shackleford. And the bottom right, the Collier $7,500 house, which is on the corner of 7th Ave and 13th Street South. Uh, which was an interesting house. It was created from a, a design in the Collier's magazine for the, for this $7,500 house and uh, had a, a number of interesting features for that time period, like the attached garage and, and greenhouse, I think, was maybe added later. Uh, also in 2016, we had a really bumper year that year. Um, the Watson residence on the left there, the upper left, uh, which is again right across from the Shackleford and the uh, Buchanan uh, in Victoria Park. Uh, in the bottom left there, we have the Galt Number no. 6 mine. This is a really interesting one for us because it's, uh, it's really our only current designation in the city that's uh, not just a, a kind of a historic structure, but also kind of a cultural, lan a cultural landscape. Um, so it sort of includes the, the grounds and the setting and so on as well. Uh, obviously, there's only really ruins left of the, the, the buildings that were there, <coughs> but the current plan uh, by the owners who are the, the developer of that neighbourhood is to turn it into a city park. So they have some designs for that that look pretty uh, interesting where they incorporate these um, these ruined structures into the park design um, and add some interpretive panels and so on. So hopefully that will be uh, completed in the next year or two. And then in the bottom right we have the, the Burns block was also designated that year. That's just um, on 3rd Ave South across from Gold Gardens there. 
in 2017, we designated the Kresge building and the Knights of Pythias block, which are both on 5th Street South in the downtown. And then in 2018, we added the, the Bergman building on the left there. That was until recently Johnny Bean Coffee, which I understand is, uh, is closed down, unfortunately. But the, the owners of this building really did a, a fantastic job turning that building around. Um, when they bought it, I think they had something like uh, two or three feet of water in the basement. Um, they pumped it out, and it, I think they said it took them something like a month. They felt like they'd pumped out the entire neighborhood's water table. Um, and th they turned it back into a productive building. So there's, there's a business, I believe, upstairs. There's an event space. They had a, an escape rooms in the basement. I'm not sure if that's still there, but it's really beautiful inside and out. And they've been doing a lot of work to, to restore that building. <coughs> and then on the right, we have the Bentley block, uh, which is just on the west side of Galt Gardens, uh, also known as the Catholic Charities building. Uh, so that uh, actually includes the, the three story portion and the single story portion you can see there. Uh, this site was really interesting because it started out, it was uh, one of the first um, kind of general stores in Lethbridge um, in the very early days and it started out as a tent and then a few months later it was a kind of a, a wooden structure, a single story uh, and then I think just a, a couple of years after that it became a, a two story wooden structure um, and that must have been going well, business is going well for them and they constructed the three story brick. Uh, building that's there today, which was Lethbridge's first three-story building. Um, and then 10 years or so later, they replaced the two-story wooden structure with the, the single-story brick structure that's there today. So uh, this one's been through a bit of ups and downs in the last few years. Um, the previous owners um, applied for the designation. Uh, they were renovating the whole building into apartments and commercial on the main floor but uh, they basically stripped the building back before they started rebuilding it. They, uh, I, I guess, ran into financial difficulties. Um, and so it's now with new ownership, but currently it's still basically a shell. Uh, the new owners are working on uh, the single story portion. They're looking to bring that back into active use as, as offices, I believe. And then after that's completed, hopefully they'll, they'll be turning their attention to the, the three story portion. So then in 2019, we designated the Bank of Montreal building, uh, again, 3rd Ave South, just across from Galt Gardens. Um, there was originally a, a different Bank of Montreal building on this site, which was smaller <coughs> and a different style. That was replaced by the, the current one, uh, I believe, in the 1950s. So you can see a historic and, and modern photo of that there. So that's currently the Gate Church. And then in 2021, the Lands Residence was designated. So this is on the, um, the western edge of London Road neighborhood, just overlooking the Coolies. Um, it was really interesting, just mainly from a kind of a construction materials and architectural point of view. So it's, it's sort of a four square house, which we have a number of here, but it's, uh, it's all constructed of cast concrete blocks, even these um, sort of Ionic Corinthian hybrid uh, columns and on the front porch, it's all concrete. So that was quite an interesting one. Um, and then in 2022, we designated the Oliver Block, which obviously Hunter Heggie had done a fantastic job um, saving that building as well, which was in a really bad state before he started working on it. So I'm, I'm running low on time, so I'll, I'll keep this fairly brief, but Basically, when, when a place is designated like this, if the owner wants to make changes to the property, they come to us uh, just to check that it's all okay with the, with the designation, um, and we give them an intervention approval. Um, if it's something more controversial, that has to go through City Council, but that's extremely rare. That's just if they wanted to perhaps you know, r remove a character-defining element, something like that. <coughs> So we're currently working on updating our heritage management plan. Um, the current plan from 2007 doesn't include indigenous heritage. And so we're looking to rectify that. Um, we've been working with consultants and with the, the Blackfoot Confederacy Nations and the Métis uh, Nation of Alberta over the last year, year or two. Um, so this is it's a really big subject. It's uh, something that's actually quite new and we're fairly cutting edge on this. There aren't really a lot of places in Canada that have, have done this work so far, so um, there's a lot of learning involved in figuring out, you know, how do we protect these Indigenous heritage sites without kind of museumizing them, because some of them have been in continuous cultural use for thousands of years, so we don't want to step in and say, no, you can't continue to use this site or you can't change it however you see fit. 
So there's a lot to be worked out there. So what we're doing with the new plan is, is creating that kind of framework that we can build on with our Indigenous partners in, in the coming years and kind of figure these things out together and continue to update the plan uh, as we figure those things out. And there'll be a draft of that uh, plan going out for public consultation in the next week or two. So keep your, your, your eyes peeled for that. <coughs> So this is kind of where we are with the project. We've we've been through all these various steps that I won't go through because we're running out of time. But essentially, the next step is to take that full draft out to the public um, and then make any changes that are needed and then take that final draft to City Council in the next uh, month or two. So thanks so much for uh, your attention. And uh, George and I would be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much, George and Ross. And now we come to the question period. We ask that you line up here where Knut is standing. Please state your name and your question briefly. No long preludes, please. If you prefer to write your question, those that are legibly written and signed will be asked by me, the moderator. Um, please have a few questions. Never mind. OK. <laughs> Reading my notes to myself. Okay, so please come up if you've got your questions ready. All right, Knud and Leona. Hi, my name is Knud Peterson. Uh, I would just like to ask the questioners to adjust their body to the microphone rather than the microphone to your body. <laughs> uh, my question relates to what, how much are people allowed to do inside the building without permission? Can they change the toilet if they need, if needed? Uh, what, what's the process in terms of changing things inside the house? They're very tall. Pardon? They're very tall. Uh, yeah, great, great question. Thank you. Um, so. The short answer is that we, we don't take as much interest in, in the interior of the building. Um, the, the long answer is that we, uh, when we write that document that I talked about, the statement of significance with the list of character defining elements, um, we only include things on there that the, the owner is, is comfortable with, saying, you know, this is going to be preserved. And almost always those are um, exterior features of the building. So it's very few of our designations in Lethbridge have interior features on that list of character defining elements. Um, so if it's, uh, if it's not included on that list, we, we really don't uh, care too much about you changing it. So yeah, routine stuff, we, we, we wouldn't uh, have anything, any kind of restriction on you, on you changing that. Leona Jacobs. Um, so my question, I have a few, so, and since the line is fairly short, um, one is, is your evaluation of historical on a sliding scale, given that time moves on? Um, that's one question. Uh, the second question is, what about neighborhoods, so that, in fact, you prevent sort of the um, encroachment of modern architecture mixed up with the historical architecture you want to preserve. And the third question is, I saw a house up there that you mentioned had the, the entryway changed, the columns removed, balcony moved. So what happens with the consequences of changes made over time before the historical designation? All those? Uh, I think so. <laughs> okay, just go ahead and start the process. Right um, sorry, the first part was, again, the Slightly, that ah, yes. Evolution. Right, yes. So um, we generally we don't consider historic places that are younger than a certain number of years. I think is it thirty years? Fifty. Fifty years. Um, and so obviously, yes, that that moves on with each year. Um, it, it hasn't really come up much, though. I think people tend to not approach us unless they have something quite a bit older than that. Um, but it's interesting, you know, to see how that'll change over time as, you know, mid-century modern buildings become increasingly historic and increasingly rare and so on. Um, 
And then you asked about uh, the, the neighbourhoods. Yes, no, that's a great question. Uh, so in the new heritage management plan, uh, we have a section talking about that, about how the, the different approaches to protecting areas rather than individual properties. So um, the Historical Resources Act allows us to designate a municipal historic area. Um, that has in practice only been used, I think, twice in the whole province uh, by Medicine Hat. <clears throat> and the reason seems to be just that it's, it's quite difficult to get everyone on board with the designation because similar to designating an individual property, you need everyone to apply and, and sign a, a waiver that you're not going to sue the city for designating it and so on. So you would have to get everyone on board. Um, it also obviously introduces a lot of restrictions which people may be happy with in the short term, but then they may sell their home and the next person may not want those restrictions and so on. So it can introduce a lot of complications. There are alternative approaches that have been used, um, such as the city of Edmonton, uh, I forget the name, of it's maybe Westmount. Uh, they have an area which they, uh, rather than designating, they created a set of design guidelines for that neighborhood and they rezoned all those properties to a direct control district with these these guidelines <clears throat> and so that just allowed them to to control the architectural design of new new buildings in that area so that's an alternative approach that um that is an option as well for the city in the future um and then your third question i think was about the north residence with the yeah so that uh those changes to that building were made before it was designated um if the owner decided that they want to restore it to its original um, appearance, we would look at the list of character defining elements and if the current form is, is, is listed, then we would say, no, sorry, you can't change that. If it's not listed, then certainly they could, they could look to restore that original appearance if they wanted to do. Um, one thing I maybe didn't mention in the talk was that when you have a designated property, you can apply to the province for uh, grants. So up to $50,000 per year in matching grants. Um, in practice, you tend to get a lot less than that because the, the province hasn't increased funding for over a decade. Um, so they can apply for funding to for, for things including um, restoration as well as conservation. So something as simple as replacing the roof or fixing the foundation is, is can be considered conservation. Um, and then in that case, it would be restoration as well. <laughs> Get up on my toes. <laughs> Uh, Carol Sakia, a couple of questions. Um, the University of Lethbridge, I, I was interested to hear about the 50 year, but sounds to me like that should become a designated something, or rather before it falls into the river or something. Um, and why aren't there any schools on there? Because I, I know at least one school where I went to elementary, it's still a, around and it's at least 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question, Carol. Um, I think if you um, uh, hearken back to a couple of things we mentioned in the in the uh, presentation, um, we would love to uh, designate a school if the school board actually came forward uh, with an application. Likewise, uh, with with the university, uh, we may identify uh, something that might be an appropriate historic resource. But unless the actual landowner comes forward, then you know there's there's really not much that we can do. And that's that's the direction that we've got from city council. And as we um, try to uh, get across, is that. Um, we want this to be an amicable type of process as, as much as possible. So we don't really want to create conflict, you know, between um, a, a property owner and another property owner and, and that kind of thing. So um, we found that even though there isn't a huge uptake, I mean, there's still quite a few sites, um, the pace at which some of this uh, change uh, takes place is, is manageable at the present time. So. Um, if, if um, again, if a, a school board or even the university decided that you know they've got something that they really want to um, uh, have, have designated, draw attention to, we would certainly uh, welcome that and would work very closely with them to make sure it happens. <coughs> That's okay. W. Oh, I see. Okay, something got caught. Henning Mundell. <coughs> Sorry, Henning Mundell here. 
um, my question, I have sort of a broader and then a more specific. My broader aspect of the question is how many of these provincially or municipally designated heritage sites are city owned? And specifically, I want to know what is the uh, then the the ramifications in relation to utilization and changes, and then specifically about the Bowman. Is that a city owned? And what are then the potential future uh, uses for it? Thanks. Um, so the, I'm not sure of the exact number that are uh, city owned, but certainly the Bowman, uh, I believe the Galt Museum as well. Um, Nico Yuko, uh, city owned. So uh, it really doesn't change anything. It's just that the city is then the owner. So um, if the city wants to make a change to those buildings, they have to apply to me <laughs> and George for uh, the, the, the intervention approval if needed. Um, uh, and so it, it just goes through the same process as any other applicant, really. Um, I, I believe you asked about the, the Bowman as well in terms of uh, future plans and so on. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any um, details with that at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, George? No. Um, I know there have been a lot of rumors in the community that the, you know some changes might happen with the building and that kind of thing. That's in city council's lap to decide whether they actually want to sell it or not. And uh, if there are any changes that would affect the uh, character defining elements or you know the statement of significance of that building, that's where we would actually uh, get involved. So to my knowledge, none of that has, has taken place at this point in time. I'm Echo Bukharli, and the Bowman was something that I wanted some clarification on. Also, um, I have a personal interest. Stand closer. I also have a personal interest in uh, Brigadier General J. S. Stewart property, and uh, I know it's an old place. And I wondered what the status was of that. Has anybody applied or mm -hmm. it made acknowledgement? Thank you for that question. Um, I, I know the, the property that you're talking about, and so far the owners haven't come forward, but that I think would be a very valuable uh, addition to the, to the resources. Uh, General Stewart, I mean, you know, probably our most famous military person in the history of the city. So uh, I think there, there's certainly, there's architectural merit in the building and then there's historic value in terms of uh, ownership and, and things of that nature. So thank you for that question. Yes, Tom, my name is Tom McLeod. Anyway, uh, I'm just curious to know, uh, because every time I drive to the west side, I see the old number eight mine, and I'm one of the, probably one of the few people here who, who remembers when it was still in operation. <laughs> but anyway, is, there any, uh, is that part of the future, or is it uh, something that's been looked at, or is it outside the realm of the city to the province, because it's a pretty historic site considering the relationship to Lethbridge and coal mines and it was the last operating one in the city and maybe the second last operating one in southern Alberta. So there you go. <laughs> Thanks, great question. Um, so uh, we have been asked about this before. I think the last time was uh, maybe three or four years ago and, and I believe we approached the owner um, I don't want to get the details wrong, but I think essentially it was the case that they were looking at options for the, the surrounding area, and so they, they weren't interested in designation at that time. Um, but I agree with you, it's, it, would, it would be a great site to, to have designated. I, th I think the tower there originally came from the number six mine, which is designated, and it was moved over there um, until it closed in the 30s, I think. So yeah, it, certainly, again, if the owner wanted to apply for designation, I think it would certainly have some potential. Uh, I, my name's Cheryl Bradley, and thank you for your presentation. I've learned a lot. Uh, with respect to indigenous heritage sites, I'm imagining the whole ownership considerations are rather complex. So I'd just like to hear a little bit more about what your considerations are regarding that. 
Thanks. Uh, you know, excellent question. Um, yeah, that it is a big question of, of how we're going to handle that, and I think that's one of the main things we'll have to talk about with the, uh, our Indigenous partners in the next couple of years. Is um, so, so a lot of their uh, historic places tend to be in the River Valley, as you'd imagine, and and so the River Valley is really fragmented in terms of ownership. There's some city ownership, obviously, and, and some private land ownership as well, uh, and so that question of ownership. You know, can vary between the the actual legal land title owner versus the ownership in terms of the the heritage itself. So you could find an indigenous heritage site that's on privately owned property by a non-indigenous person. Um, <clears throat> Under the Historical Resources Act, there really isn't any provision for that. Um, I understand they may be looking at um, potential updates to to better encompass indigenous heritage at some point. Uh, and so we're going to have to work through those issues on a case-by-case -case basis, I think, in, for the next few years um, until we can figure figure things like that out. But yeah, certainly it's a, we're really kind of at the cutting edge of that right now. Um, there aren't, aren't a lot of examples in Canada right now. If I could just add to what Ross said, I, yes, I think we're going to have to be very creative, as he said. You know, we're on the cutting edge of this, and I think when you look at um, a culture as old as as the Blackfoot culture in southern Alberta and their concepts of of ownership, you know, how how do you um, you know overlay that with actual property rights that that people currently have? So we're going to have to be careful with that. There was a study uh, done uh, a couple of years ago, traditional uh, knowledge and land use study, and a lot of sites were actually identified. But it's it's a it's a dicey thing to uh, have some of that information made public because we're worried about vandalism and and those kinds of things. So again, that that enters into the equation in terms of you know how we go about you know future designations. We figured it out. Leona Jacobs again. So I'm coming back to Carol's question and a response that you gave about the number eight mine, where you actually approached the owner. Um, but you said it, it's all owner driven. So do these people who have these sites of interest, do they actually know that it's a site of interest, that this is an option for them to apply for heritage status? Thank you, Lillian. That's that's a good question. Uh, I guess what we should have said is that we, from time to time we do um, go out to the community, and this is certainly an opportunity uh, for that to take place. To say, you know, the doors are open. Uh, we're willing to to entertain applications, and with with the survey work that has been done and some of the more detailed stuff, we have an idea of of a number of sites, and uh, um, so we don't have all houses and things like that we, we want a little bit more diversity in terms of the the kinds of designations that we do have so it's it's kind of an iterative iterative process in terms of you know coming up with properties and things like that so we may actually approach an owner if we perhaps there might be a sale that we become aware of and say you know had you thought about this or, or whatnot so it's not entirely owner driven but primarily property owner driven Hi, Barb Phillips, and thank you. I learned a lot, and and I'm glad Lethbridge does not tear everything down like a community that I moved from, where you know if you get old, it's got to go. And as I get old, I don't believe that too much. <laughs> anyway, I know a family member has a house in London Road, which was 1912. I think it was a working man's house. But it has some interesting features inside, one being the panels from the Alex Arms Hotel originally. And so I don't know, maybe it should, it could be designated. I was wondering, does designation actually detract or improve the property and the community's view of it anyway? Something like that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that, that's a good question, and I think Ross addressed part of that earlier uh, when we talk about integrity. So, it, for for a house or any property to be designated, certainly the more uh, original elements there are to the property, the better. And so that that would be part of the evaluation. So the panels, for example, if they aren't original, you know that that really wouldn't enhance the heritage value. Um, 
there's mixed reviews on whether uh, a heritage designation will add or detract from the value of the property. We believe that it adds, and um, there are social, economic, and environmental reasons for that. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to, to you know, uh, maybe change, modify an existing building as opposed to all the energy that's required to rip a building down and replace it, and sometimes, you know, uh, with certainly a less aesthetic building, and also one that maybe doesn't respond as well to climatic changes and things like that. So there's there's some good arguments to be made there. <clears throat> In terms of other elements, we have had a, a few uh, properties that have been designated where the owner has actually, on their own behalf, wanted to have some of the internal elements. Uh, recognized as a as part of the statement of significance or character defining element, so it's it's uh, it's unusual, but it will happen or it could happen. Um, at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that owners have the most flexibility possible to make changes to their to their property as long as they really don't affect the integrity of the of the property. So. <coughs> As moderator, I also have a question. And yes, thank you. I'm learning an awful lot. Um, <clears throat> my husband and I used to live in the little village of Sterling, which has its own specific characteristics of the, the wide streets and the layout because of the time in which it was constructed when the Mormons came up here. So um, I'm wondering about the round street in Lethbridge, the long street that was used for carriages to turn around. Is it possible for a street to be designated as a heritage site? And uh, and then would that be something that you could go to the city and ask about the same as the schools? And, um, and then what would be the ramifications of having a street designated? Thanks, great question. Um, so I mentioned earlier about Medicine Hat having two municipal historic areas. Uh, one of those is a street actually, and I spoke to their heritage planner about that process and apparently what happened was originally they wanted to designate the street as well as the properties either side, it's all homes I think. Um, but through not being able to get all the property owners to agree, they eventually just shrunk it down to literally just the right of way, so the, you know, the sidewalks and boulevards and the, the roadway and everything. And so that one of their two municipal historic areas is just a, a right of way like that. Um, so it's certainly possible, um, as Medicine Hat have done. Um, the value of that, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the value of that is necessarily. Uh, how much is the street going to change over time without designation? Um, you know, depending on the street, sure, it could be the configuration could be changed, you know, the trees could go or, or be added, or bike lanes could come in, or something like that. But yeah, I'm not sure what the value would be, but certainly something you could approach us with and we could look into. Let me just add to that, uh, to what Ross said. Fifth Street has really changed since it was first built. Like, we almost killed business on that street when we widened it to four lanes. And so uh, there are plans in the Harbor City Master Plan to actually, you know, reconfigure that street so it is, it emulates more what it, its historic past was. But I think that there really isn't much integrity left in terms of what, you know, historic value there might have been for that street. I mean, even the, uh, and this is one of those infrastructure kinds of considerations, even the underground lines that for the old streetcars, you know, those were taken out because it was impractical uh, in terms of modern day requirements to actually, you know, retain those kinds of things. They interfered with your replacement of water lines and sewer lines and power lines and everything else that goes underground. Yeah, my name, <coughs> me. My name is Terry Shillington, and I, I have a twofold question. The first is, uh, why, w as a property owner, why would I want to have my property designated? I can see downsides. It could be, could be some interference with some renovation plans I might have. So I don't, I'm not hearing any upside, except you know, maybe civic pride or something. Um, secondly, I sh share Bev's uh, question about naming a street in some places like Kimberley have done very creative things and ambitious things with that and I'm not hearing within your committee's sense of your own vision any 
any contemplation of that because you have to wait for owners uh, to uh, to make the initiative. So so I'm thinking there's something missing in your commission in your committee's um, vision, well, maybe a lack of aggression or or initiative or something. <laughs> very aggressive, Terry. Sure. <coughs> um, Sorry, the first part of your question was. What would be my motive as a? Oh yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, so the the main one usually for people is is the grant money from the the province. So once uh, your property is designated, you can apply for those matching grants of up to fifty thousand dollars per year. Um, <clears throat> typically, people tend to get about maybe twenty or thirty percent of what they apply for uh, if they're successful. But certainly, it's still better than nothing so th and that could be for anything that falls under you know conservation like e simple things like repairing your foundation would, would be eligible um, that's usually the main motivation for people in fact sometimes we've had issues with people applying for designation solely with their eyes on, on that grant money but really not necessarily considering the the other ramifications of, of designation so it's certainly something that has to be considered in a serious way and, and we try to make people very aware of, of, of what they're signing up for. Um, but you know, in, in practice, I think my experience working on this for the last five or six years or so uh, is that Historic Places Advisory Committee are, are very pragmatic. Um, you know, they, they don't try to preserve every tiny little detail. It's, it's really just working with the owners to find that middle ground and, uh, and make sure that they, they are able to adapt their property over time. Um, so I, d I haven't seen it hold people back uh, too much. Um, and then, uh, oh, the, about the committees uh, being more aggressive. Uh, well, George, you're the chair of the committee. Would you like to <laughs> comment? <laughs> well, w one of the things, we are, we are volunteers, uh, so there's, there's that overlay. But I think that uh, when you look at the complexity of, of the city, there are a lot of neighborhood plans that uh, have been undertaken and, and are underway. And so I think a lot of the initiative and the vision for some of these areas uh, is defined through those plans. And I, I see us more as a facilitator for some of the things that um, might be desired in, in some of these neighborhoods, because there's a lot more consultation that takes place you know, within the neighborhoods, the people who are actually affected by this. And you know, it's not that we're opposed to doing that, but you know, we only have, we only have so much time at, at the end of the day when it comes down to it. So it's more a matter of trying to facilitate, you know, something that, you know, somebody else is, is really driving. It's not that we don't have a vision for that. I mean, that's what the Heritage Management Plan is for. But at the same time, we don't necessarily have the resources to fulfill that. We don't, I mean, Ross, in addition to supporting this committee, he, does, he has another job too. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it comes down to that. This will be our last question. Hi there, it's Bev Trainer. Uh, my question is similar probably to what Bev's was. I'm curious about the old uh, World War II uh, site where they had prisoner the prisoner of war site. You know, if something like that might be acknowledged in some way, they would give the history of it. So, there you go. Maybe I could just uh, add something. You know, there's another entity in the city that might be uh, even more effective than our committee for that, and that might be the Historical Society in terms of its plaque program and recognition. So uh, I represent that committee on this board, so I can certainly uh, take that back to the Historical Society and, and see, because I agree with you. My, my grandfather, during the Second World War, actually delivered dairy products out to the out to the prison war camp. So I've got, got a personal stake in that one. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, and, and similar to a couple of other ones that were mentioned earlier, uh, that one has been suggested before and we've we've contacted the owners and last time, which was again probably three or four years ago, they, they didn't want to pursue designation at that time. Um, obviously they're doing a lot of building work out there at the moment, but certainly if they if they were up for applying then it, I think it would probably uh, meet the criteria.